Greetings, unsettled souls. <laughs> Sam I. B. De Ganji doing political commentary with the correct views, of course. The media speaks. You might know me from Blasted News or Wits News or any of those places. If you do, thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. Nothing like getting news that you really don't want right before you go live, is there? All right, that's okay, because we overcome, we persevere. Um, I do want to say real quick to some people, um, we got news in this that pertains, in a way, to COVID-19. It's later on in the show. And it also talks about how it relates to Fukushima. But prior to that, I want to talk about uh, some of the the failings that I have seen locally. And I wonder if other people have seen this as well. Fortunately, I ended up, uh, I don't obviously do not have COVID-19, but I have uh, had a job that's had me in and out of the rain or whatever during this. I have become an essential worker as it were. And my throat was scratchy. In Canton, Ohio, there is no way to get tested. Unless you want to go to the emergency room, hope they test you, and spend copious amounts of money to find out that you probably do not have COVID-19. In other words, if someone tries to do the right thing, if someone just tries to get tested out of an abundance of caution, it can't be done. Meanwhile, you know, they have people like me working around other people. I mean, social distance as much as you can, but you can only do so much, you know. So I did want to, I wondered if other people in other areas were noticing that. Again, luckily, it was just because I've been in and out of the rain today. Everything's gone. No sniffles, no anything. Needless to say, it was not COVID-19. But I am interested to know if other people have had the same kind of experience that I did regarding. And um, let me know. Let me know in the comment lines below. I also want to remind you that if you wish to donate, you can do so at the correct views at hotmail.com through PayPal. Shout out to Mike and Trish who donated. And uh, when you donate, I promote your favorite charity on the show. And I think it's a pretty good trade-off. It helps charities, and it also keeps uh, the show afloat. St. Jude's and Clean the Oceans. Uh, Clean the Oceans is interesting. That charity is uh, sucking up the plastic out of the ocean, the great plastic patch. I've said this for years, that somebody should do it. Finally, some people are. It's free money. Uh, plastic in the middle of the ocean, they're recycling it, using it for, you know, computers, whatever, 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 just taking it right out of the ocean. And uh, also, of course, St. Jude's, we know what they do. We know what they do for children, and we know what good people they are. All right, friends, getting into the <clears throat> massive Fukushima update. Huffington Post. Nuclear power causes cancer. What the industry doesn't want you to know. Now, this is dated from 2011, and everything else I have is Fukushima-related within the last month, which it usually is. But I wanted to get to this because a friend of mine on Facebook was commenting on how safe he believed nuclear power plants to be. And uh, it, sometimes people have beliefs which are false, but they believe them based on what mainstream sources have told them. The trouble is with many things, particularly nuclear, is the mainstream has a vested interest via advertising through General Electric and DuPont and Westinghouse. They have a, and others, they have a vested interest in not letting you know what the truth is regarding this. So I'm going to go ahead and read some of this. Nuclear power, frequently mentioned as one option of meeting future energy needs, would pose a health threat to Americans if a meltdown occurred. But despite meltdowns at Chernobyl and Three Mile Island and many other near misses, there is another dirty little secret that the nuclear industry doesn't want you to know. Cancer risks from nuclear plants aren't just potential risks, they are actual risks. And I wanted to really get to this today because it's important to realize that even when nuclear power plants are running exactly as they are supposed to run, they are cancer factories. Helen Caldercott, I've said it many times on this show, Dr. Caldercott refers to routine releases. That is the, the standard protocol for nuclear power plants, even when 
they're running properly. And there are radioactive elements in that, in, in the release, which has to be done for the plant to function properly. Those lead to cancers. Routine release equals routine cancer, to quote Caldecott. Every day it says doctors must routinely release a portion of radioactive, reactors, excuse me, must routinely release a portion of radioactive chemicals into the air and water each day. The same chemicals found in atomic bomb tests. They enter human bodies through breathing and the food chain. Federal law obligates nuclear companies to measure these emissions and the amounts that end up in the air, water, and food and to report them to federal regulators. However, nuclear advocates consistently claim that these releases are below federally permitted limits and thus are harmless. But this thinking is a leap that ignores hard evidence from scientific studies. Now, after half a century of a large-scale experiment with nuclear power, the verdict is in. Nuclear reactors cause cancer. Did you hear that? The claim that low doses of radiation are harmless has always been just a claim. It led to practices like routine diagnostic x-rays to the pelvis of pregnant women, until the work of the University of Oxford Dr. Alice Stewart found that these x-rays doubled the chance that the fetus would die as, the child, uh, as a child. Many studies later, independent experts agreed that no dose is safe. A 2005 report by a blue ribbon panel of National Academy of Sciences, for those who say that I don't give sources, revealed hundreds of scientific articles and concluded that there is no risk-free dose of radiation. There is no safe dosage of radiation, plain and simple. Federal health officials who should be responsible for tracking cancer near nuclear reactors and analyzing their containments have ignored the dangers. The only national analysis on the topic was a 1990 study, so we're nice and recent, mandated by Senator Edward Kennedy and conducted by the National Cancer Institute. But this study was biased before it even got started. A January 28, 1988 letter to Senator Kennedy from the National Institutes of Health Director Dr. James Weingarten brazenly declared, the most serious impact of the Three Mile Island accident that can be identified with certainty is mental stress. Oh, just a mental stress to those living near the plant, particularly pregnant women and families with teenagers and young children. Not surprisingly, the study concluded that there was no evidence of high cancer rates near reactors. No upgraded study has been conducted by the federal officials. Now you have to understand, I, I and many people like me have said, whatever you do, do not eat Hershey's chocolate because that was in the line of fire for Three Mile Island. And the radionuclides that fell on the area and the dairy that's been absorbed, and we all know the dairy soaks up radioactivity like sponge, strontium-90, for instance. Those elements are still in that area, and they're still just as toxic as they were when the accident happened in the seven seventy nine. But on the half-life of uh, radioactive nuclei, it wasn't even a moment in time. And this is still, you know, common knowledge. Like, again, to quote Dr. Caldecott, she said she'd love Hershey's to sue her for saying this because she would love to show them the mounds of data that she has proving that she is correct. All of this gets ignored. With God, and again, when, when the chocolate gets sent out and other people eat it, cancer rates will, to some degree, go up for everyone. So it looks like Three Mile Island, in and of itself, that area of PA, doesn't have high rates. See how that works? But even with that being true, if you actually do some study, you can find that the cancer rates did go up near Three Mile Island. And that the the, uh, the Kennedy report was flawed, to say the least. Going on here, with government on the sidelines, it was up to the independent researchers publishing results in medical and scientific journals to generate the needed evidence. Studies were limited until the 1990s, but the few publications consistently documented high local cancer rates near reactors. Imagine that. Dr. Richard Clapp of Boston University found high leukemia rates near the Pilgrim plant in Massachusetts. Colorado health official Dr. Carl Johnson documented high child cancer rates near the San Ofri plant in California. 
Columbia University researchers showed that cancer cases within a 10 mile radius of the Three Mile Island plant soared by 64% in the first five years after the 1979 meltdown. Following the government's party line, they claimed that stress rather than radiation caused this increase. Yeah, because stress is causing cancer in these numbers. But the cat was out of the bag. Dr. Stephen Wing of the University of North Carolina published a paper using the same data confirming the radiation to cancer link, not stress to cancer link. <sighs> Joseph Mangiano, uh, M. PH MBA, executive director of the Radiation and Public Health Project, has authored 23 scientific articles since the mid-1990s documenting the high local cancer rates near nukes. One study showed child cancer exceeded the national rate near 14 out of 14 plants in the eastern U.S. So that's a coincidence, right? All 14, 100%, that's a coincidence. Another showed that when the U.S. nuclear plants closed, Local infant death and child cancer cases plunged immediately after the shutdown. And it goes on and on and on in this article, over and over and over again. Um, a nationwide study of current cancer rates near nukes is sorely needed. Yeah, of course it is. And you know why it's not going to be done again? That's Huffington Post if you want the rest of that. Um, do you know why it's not being done? Because of the vested interest that I talked about when I opened the show. That's why. The bottom line being worth more than your health. Obviously, that's, that's the uh, DuPont way. That's the General Electric way. It's the Westinghouse progressive way. Friends, the sun.co.uk. Looming carnage. Japan predicts a mega 9.0 earthquake and a 100-foot tsunami that will devastate the country and obliterate Fukushima, the Fukushima power plant. And this is the 23rd of April, 2020. This isn't referring to the other one. And this is important because the, uh, the same people that predicted what would happen in Fukushima in 2011, those people were ignored, leading to, we now have a mini neutron star burning away in the middle of our planet, in the middle of Japan. An uncontrolled, they still can't control the reaction. It's still spewing radioactivity all over the world. The jet stream carries it all over the U.S. The same people that warned about it then are warning now once again. The trouble is we don't even have the technology to get near the reactors. And yet we're supposed to, we're supposed to trust that everything is okay. What, remember when uh, General Electric said they were in cold shutdown at Fukushima? Cold shutdown is impossible to achieve if you cannot approach the reactors and if you don't even know where all of the fuel is. A monster tsunami towering up to 100 feet could smash into Japan's dens densely populated coastal areas following a 9.0 mega earthquake threatening millions of lives. You think? A Japanese government panel of scientists and seismologists are warning huge tidal waves that could strike the East Coast, with, which includes the already stricken Fukushima nuclear power plant. The panel assumed the worst case scenario and said that an earthquake was imminent around the Japan Trench and the Kur Kuril Trench, which are underwater fault lines. The scientists also said that it was plausible that a monster wave could happen soon because every 300 to 400 years, a mass, massive quake has taken place. And the last one occurred in the 17th century. So they're talking about something even more significant here. Seismologist Kenji Stataki told the Minichi newspaper that it was a matter of when, not if. This isn't hypothetical. This is fact. The panel used a simulation based on analysis of tsunamis of the past 6,000 years and covered seven prefectures, including Hokkaido, Iwate, Miyagi, Fukushima, Abarak, Amurai, and Chiba. The panel predicts Awate, uh, Awate and Hawakido would be the worst hit with a tsunami of nearly 100 feet high. But most worrying at all of all, Fukushima Strickland Power Station is also in the firing line of the giant wave. In the event that this plant would fall, you could be looking at a potential extinction event. 
you could be looking at the northern hemisphere being uninhabitable. And of course, you won't be told that. You'll be told it's safe. Just live there. Go about your day. There's nothing to be concerned about. That's what you're always told when something like this happens. Meanwhile, people will be dropping dead of cancer and heart ailments and other diseases like flies. The earthquake that struck off Japan's coast in 2011 had a magnitude of 7, spawning a tsunami that led to the meltdown of the fur reactors. Here, engineers are continuing to struggle to curb the release of radioactive material, which they have not been able to do. Uh, the waves were 36 feet, uh, were 70 feet high, and it overran the 36-foot uh, wall that's been planned to protect the site in the future. A spokesman said Temkin from TEPCO said uh, that they will examine the latest projections and analyze the impact on the ongoing preventive measures against tsunamis that the company has been taking. All of this is theater, friends. This is all theater. They have absolutely no way to deal with the problem that they have caused, which is why the answer to nuclear should always be no. The global warming lie, there's no man-made global warming, there's no man-made climate change. All of the data proves this to be true. It's being used to push an agenda and to make money, and it is extremely toxic. If the largest of these were repeated now, it would be that create a tsunami capable of inundating by Pakin Bay, which is an area close to the proposed capital. So on and on and on, we're looking at these ongoing issues here. And no one seems to really care that much about it because it looks like something, you know, oh, it, you know, it's somewhere else. It's not here. No, it is here. The jet stream brings that poison to the United States, friends. Uh, this is from EFLUX. It's called Architecture at the Border, the Entropic Silence of Fukushima. And it is an extremely large article that I suggest that everyone reads. It has a lot of information in it pertaining to radio, radioactivity, and I'll cover some of it. I don't want to do all of it because it would, it would be here for an hour and a half and nobody's going to watch. Um, if you do want me to cover this more, leave a message in the comment and I will. But this was important. And this just stood out to me, this one part here. Um, symptoms of the entropic silence abound. In 2010, Japan ranked 11th in the world in media freedom. Since the disaster... A concerted project of government intimidation, corporate and self-censorship has created a repressive climate for speech and tumbled Japan down on the media freedom list to 67th between Niger and Malawi. It is openly known that they are lying to the people for the good of the money from the Olympics and for the good of the pocketbook. Not, not to have to face the piper, as it were, for what they have brought upon the planet by foolishly opening this nuclear power station on an active earthquake zone. Whatever the radioactive isotopes, wherever the radioactive isotopes landed after Fukushima, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, in effect, became responsible for the local welfare providing affected individuals with monthly compensation for those forcibly displaced and compensation for the loss of homes and jobs. While the welfare of the population is usually the concern of the state, here the contamination effectively produced an amalgamated territory of private dominion. Radioactive nucleides fused with atoms of capital. This contamination set in motion a dual progress of community privatization and privatization of individual well-being. Similar processes can be seen with fracking. In other words, let's just buy the people off after we've poisoned them, after we've ruined their homes, and after we have absolutely destroyed their livelihood, destroyed their lives, destroyed their health, destroyed the health of their children, biologically changed their DNA, and then openly lied about it, and continue to lie about it, now. Um, friends, listen to this. Um, this is regarding the, uh, the, rig, the robots. And the reason I mention this, the robots here, uh, is we, like I said, we currently 
do not have the ability to even approach the nuclear power stations. We, we have no idea how to get anywhere near them. So coming up with some way to, because what happens is the, the robotics, the, the machinery of the robot are literally cooked by the radioactivity in the plants. Machines can't even get close to it. Well, this is from Nippon.com, N-I-P-P-O-N, Innovation from Destruction, the Robotics Testing in Fukushima. Fukushima Prefecture, of course, devastated by the earthquake. Uh, visitors at the Haramachi Ku, a district in the middle of Fukushima, in Miname Soma, will notice a swath of bare land stretching all the way to the giant seawall over a kilometer away. The barren landscape is interrupted and in what looks like a factory with exposed tanks and pipes, a concrete tunnel, and a runway. This is Fukushima's robot testing field, a centerpiece on the Fukushima Innovation Coast Framework, <coughs> an, innova an innovative being advanced by the national and prefectural governments. This area was devastated in the 2011 tsunami, says Ishi Wakajin, head of the Fukushima Innovation Coast Framework's operations planning section. After the disaster, the ground was raised and the high seawall constructed. However, the area remains uninhabited and devoid of hotels and similar facilities, as it should be for all of recorded history in the future. The robot test field has put this land to good use and as a testing range for drones and robots. I'd hate to work there. I really hope that it will lead to a growth in the region. Again, they're trying anything they can to bring people into this poisoned area so that they can so that they can rush to make money off the land at the, on the backs of other people destroying their health with total apathy. The race to build the flying car. We all know how much my obsession with the flying car. Robotics is predicted to be a growth industry in Japan, but the lack of suitable testing environments has been a major hurdle. For example, take air mobility, a nascent industry generating plenty of buzz at the moment. The Private Public Conference for Future Air Mobility, a group established by Japan's Ministry of the Economy, Trade, and Industry in collaboration with the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Transport. These are your enemies. These are the people encouraging you to live and eat poisoned food and live in poisoned areas. They're trying to get tourism there, aims to make commercial airborne delivery services a reality in 2023. So that's also being tested there. The trouble is to bring industry into that area is to sign those working up at this area for cancer, for heart disease, for miserable health, for sick children, and for damaged DNA. That is the correct views. Friends, we've got two more to get to. Let me remind you, if you would like to donate to the show, and I sure could use it, particularly during a pandemic, although I am working a bit now, uh, you can reach me at the correct views of hotmail.com through PayPal. And it would be a massive help if you did that. A Tokyo Review, COVID-19, what Japan failed to learn from Fukushima. This is interesting. Observing the response of COVID-19, from Tokyo throughout March and April, one can't help but be reminded of the time around the triple meltdowns at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. In those days, rumors have swept through social media, such as the idea that people might protect themselves against the virus by microwaving face masks or using vodka as a hand sanitizer. In another throwback, waves of panic buying have swept across Japan, although instead of bottled water and sleeping bags, now the items are face masks and toilet paper. The toilet paper thing is so retarded. However, perhaps the most worrying parallel between these crises, crises is the way that the political leaders have stumbled into the same communication and policy missteps as their predecessors. Understanding the connection between the mistakes made a decade ago and the errors being made now might help Japan avoid repeating the missed opportunities of 2011. Communication breakdowns. 
One thing disasters reveal is that at crisis, the main role of political leadership is often not direct action so much as communication with the public. That's one thing that Donald Trump has been doing well in our country, I would say, regarding the uh, daily updates. Neither the government of former Prime Minister Khan Nyato, who was leader of the governing Democratic Party of Japan administration, of the Japan administration when the earthquake struck in 2011, nor the current administration of Prime Minister Abu Abi Shinzo, can be blamed for the crisis they faced. However, well, in both cases, citizens expected their leaders to explain the country's plight and the government's response. In their respect, both fell short. No, instead they covered up for the nuclear industry in many instances. I think it was Abe who got cancer from being around the prefecture, if I'm not mistaken. And in 2011, the Khan administration kept making statements that were immediately overtaken by events. One day, the cabinet secretary, Adano Yukio, was on TV saying that there would be no radiation leaks, and the next day, the world watched as the reactor at the Fukushima plant exploded. Again, that's what, we have a melt out now, never seen before. Similarly, the Abe administration seemed insufficiently aware of the threat posed by COVID-19, insisting the Olympics would go on as planned until other IOC members began pulling out. Again, good for the bottom dollar, good for the money. Who cares about the health of those participating, those touring? Who cares? Who cares? Part of the reason for this delay has been the administration's belief that canceling the games unilaterally could be the result it would result in financial liabilities due to the IOC contract. Who cares? Health before money. In all instances, yes, I said it. If that makes me a horrible conservative, then so be it. I'd rather be a human being than a good conservative. Yes, I'm libertarian. Yes, I'm more on the conservative side of things. But this is ridiculous. The government's first concern should clearly be the health and welfare of the citizens. Thank you, Tokyo Review. And this prioritization has not reflected in official statements such as when Abe told President Trump that even delaying the games was not a subject at all. Even after this, it took weeks of pressure from prefecture-level leaders and the public health officials before the government announced the preparations to declare the state of emergency. Given this sluggish response, it is not surprising that crowds continue to flock to urban districts and the Kanto region even as Tokyo recorded 150 new cases of COVID-19 in just a 